from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 224, recorded live Friday, July 23rd, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott discusses the ASP.NET MVC3 Preview 1 with Phil Hack. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today we're chatting with Phil Hack. Today, Phil, you released uh, a preview of MVC3. Congratulations. Thank you. So, this is a preview. It's not an alpha, it's not a beta. What's the, what's the naming like? What are the rules on the naming here? <laughs> Uh, preview is uh, what we might have formally called a CTP or a community technology preview. We just generally call them previews now. Uh, but it's early bits. It's not meant, you know, for you to go and launch your business on the site. Though, I mean, if you did, I'm not going to go hunt you down. It's just at your own risk. Mm-hmm. But community technology preview, where does that fit in the alpha beta world, like in English? Oh, uh, probably within the alpha yeah. range, right? So by the preview, we mean that you get to see what we're thinking uh, about for the next version. It's not yet feature complete in any by any means. Uh, there's a lot more features we haven't yet implemented, and it's subject to change in drastic ways. Um, so, you know, typically closer to what you might consider an alpha, whereas a beta release would be something that we consider feature complete, uh names of functions and things like that aren't likely to change much, but we're looking for feedback for bugs and that sort of thing. So, yeah, we're in the very early alpha phase. Hmm. Are you looking for feedback for things that maybe you hadn't thought about, like features that we you'd missed out on or features that they want to work a different way? Uh, a little of both. Uh, so, for example, we, we have a limited budget of what features we can implement. So uh, almost more important for us right at this point is looking at the feature set that we did implement in Preview 1, are there ways we could have implemented it better to serve you know, people's needs and requirements, or are there gaps in what we did implement that would make a lot of sense for us to implement, or you know, did the things we implement, are they just plain wrong, or, or, you know, or you know, if you feel kind-hearted, what's good about the features that we implemented? And what would you like to see more of? So um, that, I think that is the thing that we most want to hear. And then, uh, you know, other features that uh, we're missing, we certainly want to hear feedback on that. Um, some of that, unless it's really cheap and, and has a big win, uh, may be harder for us to uh, factor in, you know, unless the, the idea is so good that we cut something else we were planning to implement because we realized that this would provide more value. Where, where do the ideas come from? I mean, that's... That's ultimately, is that ultimately decided by you, or is it you unless Scott Goo is in the room at the time? or what, How does that work? I have this wooden box on my wall that uh, has a big suggestion sign on it. So people come by and slip pieces of paper in, and I pull them out on time to time. <laughs> so anyone who wants, any one of the listeners who wants a feature, they just stop by your office in Seattle? Yeah, just drop, drop a, you know, fill out a suggestion form in triplicate. <laughs> and, uh, that's that's well, so agile. Yeah, agile, agile. <laughs> uh, well, uh, most of the ideas come from a variety of places. A, the the community, our uh, customers who uh, tell us, well, you know, they're doing this and they need this. Then there's the uh, Scott Guthrie factor, who uh, he often has a lot of ideas, and he comes in uh, and yeah, you know, tells tells me uh, what cool <laughs> things he thinks we should do. Gently uh, suggest. Sometimes I have my own ideas of what we should do, and mm-hmm. uh, and we also look at you know what the competition is doing to say see you know oh they're doing they're solving this problem and we're not solving that problem, mm-hmm. um, and and you know now that we've had the framework out for a couple versions, uh, some of it even comes from you know our own internal app building. Like uh, there are certain large teams at Microsoft building on ASP.NBC, so it kind of helps when we talk to them and they can tell us that, oh, you know, we'd really like to see this or that in there. Mm-hmm. What are some features in MVC3 that are either in this preview or planned that you got directly from the community? Uh, probably the biggest one is uh, the 
usage of the common service locator for dependency injection. So in MVC3 Preview 1, we've taken the common service locator interface. Uh, so that's a community-driven effort to build a common interface for uh, what you call service location. Uh, and then the various IOC or, or inversion of control uh, dependency injection container guys have all built implementations of this interface for their different DI containers. Mm -hmm. So nin there's a Ninject one, there's a uh, Windsor one, there's a Structure Map one. And so we took that interface, and in Preview 1, we copied it into our source code, though in, um, you know, our, our current goal is to actually take a dependency on the actual CSL so that you wouldn't have to recompile those implementations that are already out there. Um, but what we've done is we've taken that interface, copied it in our source code, and built up a, a set of dependency injection hooks that make use of this uh, service location interface. So that uh, feature there is, uh, comes uh, pretty directly from feedback from the community saying you need to have more dependency injection hooks in ASP.NVC. Mm -hmm. So we took that feedback and uh, we also looked at what community efforts were out there and, and uh, pulled that into our code. Was that controversial to pick the common service locator either in the community or within Microsoft, or like because you're taking a dependency at this point on, you know, on an open source project on a, on an interface level. Well, I guess some of the, you know, it remains to be seen what controversy we will face as we're just releasing. But uh, internally, there's a little bit of hesitation to take a dependency on yet another assembly. Now, fortunately, the assembly is written by the PMP group, uh, but it's a uh, you know, Microsoft.star assembly, it's not in the .NET framework, and that means that we have to deal with the overhead of shipping an extra assembly, which mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't sound like much, but it, unfortunately it's not, it's not as trivial as it sounds like. Uh, you know, in terms of now we're gonna, are we going to have to support that and have the 5 plus 5, you know, the 5 years of support and 5 years of uh, servicing or whatever, you know, you know high-level servicing contracts we have. Not only that, um, from the community, I imagine there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be a little bit of controversy in that, you know, for some DI and, and IOC container authors who originally supported the common service locator, not, not all of them continue to support that model because, you know, it by definition has to be a bit of a uh, lowest common denominator of what the DI containers out there implement. Mm -hmm. So if you're using, uh, you know, a a certain, you know, whatever DI container and you're using all its advanced features, they might not be exposed by the service locator. Uh, I think the, the good news about it, though, is that uh, we don't get in the business of having a common registration interface. All we're doing is using the service locator to look up instances based on, you know, the information you gave us. So I think, uh, and if you don't want to use the service locator API, we still have these hooks in the framework, so you can use, uh, you know, your DI container di more directly and kind of get in there and, and hook mm -hmm. things up. But uh, I think the overall benefit, I think it's overall better because, um, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to invent our own uh, interface for uh, abstracting away uh, dependency injection. We'd, I think that would go, that wouldn't go over very well at all. Uh, and I think it's, you know, overall good to support a, a community effort that, that occurred. Okay. Well, what are some other uh, significant features that are in MVC3 that people have been waiting for? Uh, I think one of the most interesting features that people have been discussing is the Razor View Engine. And this was kind of a big deal because you're actually making this the default now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, although you, you'll be able to select uh, the Webform View Engine very easily when you create a new project. Mm -hmm. But, uh, the, yeah, the Razor V engine is, has a pretty slick syntax that's based on uh, some of the work that we did for the, the Web Matrix family of products. Is this another assembly as well, or how do you uh, have an application that uses Razor in MVC and then that might also be using Razor in another way, or Razor's running in another website on the same machine? Yeah, so that what that's going to mean is that... Uh, ASP.NET MVC is going to have to take a dependency at some point on um, the uh, 
assemblies that the Razor compiler, which is in its own assembly, and and some of the, and there's there's a common infrastructure that's shared between ASP.NET web pages, uh, which is the new simple um, web matrix uh, ASP.NET framework and uh, ASP.NET MVC. So they're, we're going to have to share a common infrastructure, uh, some common infrastructure assemblies that allow us to uh, have the same syntax in both scenarios. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and then what's really, what I really like about the Razor syntax is that it's a very, very clean and terse syntax. There's, uh, it kind of strips away all the, a lot of the noise that comes with, uh, you know, current, like our current templating languages where you have this less than percent, something gr- percent greater than. Uh, mm-hmm. The Razor syntax really understands the... Uh, language, you know, the C-sharp language, and it understands HTML, and it's able to take that contextual information about, you know, the fact that it knows what C-sharp looks like and knows what HTML looks like, and uh, really uh, streamlines what you have to do within a template in order to render out HTML. So if you've seen Scott Guthrie's blog post, you can see some of the samples where, uh, you know, it's really, really clean, and when you actually start using it, and this is something I found is when I started using it, I felt like there there are many times where I was writing out a view, and uh, it's almost like things work just the way that you your your brain works, uh, if that makes any sense. So, you know, like mm. I'd do a for each loop, write some HTML, and then just cl- close the curly brace. And you know, there was a moment where I thought, oh wait, am I supposed to escape that end, you know, curly brace for the for block? Uh, but what I naturally did was just close the for block, and it just works. Now, this might none of this might make sense, but if you actually look at the code samples or yeah. get a chance to start playing with it, uh, hopefully that'll make it make more sense. <laughs> well, and what I think is significant about it, though, is that, and if I maybe be so bold, you're you're a code focused person. You know, you that you probably think in code first and HTML second. So for yeah. you. A, a a a templating language for markup that is you know fifty one percent code and forty nine percent markup makes total sense and is incredibly intuitive, and then someone else might be a markup head uh, would prefer using something like Spark, which is yeah. you know different from yeah. Razor and leans and uh, defers to HTML and markup yeah. more than yep. it defers to code. So I think that, that that's interesting though. This really is code-focused yeah. markup. And a lot of people have thought that these things were real similar. There was some initial frustration in, like, why did Microsoft invent this and why didn't they just take Spark? But I would really encourage people to try both because they're, they're really different. Yeah, I think they are really different. They're, it's a different in philosophy in terms of being uh, imperative or declarative. And I think uh, Razor is more code, as you mentioned, more code-focused. Also, unfortunately, one of the features that we haven't yet implemented in Razor is one of the ones that I think is really going to show the power of Razor, uh, which is something that we've been discussing uh, around uh, kind of like this thing called helpers, uh, where you can write methods that return blocks of HTML. And um, in C Sharp, for example, when you write a method, let's say you write an HTML.text box method, you have to kind of build up that HTML for the text box, right? You have to, you know, do the string concatenation and all this weird escaping. Mm-hmm. But with uh, CSH HTML or the Razor syntax, you know, we h- plan to have this way where you could write this function that uh, when you return HTML, you can just return HTML as a literal, st- uh, as a literal. So a lot like XML literals in VB.net, you'll have that kind of concept within. Um, Within Razor, and and all the encoding is done just for you correctly, and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. You have really powerful mechanisms for building up HTML, and uh, so you know HTML literals. I think are going to be really really cool. This is the part of the show where I mock you. Well, actually, Telerik mocks us. Your applications that you're testing dependent on external systems over which you have no control. Maybe you're being slowed down by those systems their lack of availability responsiveness, you want to do TDD right, our friends at Telerik help you solve some of those problems with their newest mocking tool, Just Mock. It'll let you do fast, simple, controlled unit tests independent of external resources like databases, web services, proprietary code. Unlike some mocking tools, Just Mock works with non-virtual methods 
sealed classes, static methods, giving you complete control of your code. You can get more details. You can download Just Mock at Telerik.com slash Just Mock. And don't forget to thank Telerik for supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page, Facebook.com slash Telerik. Thanks a lot. Are HTML literals that's something that someone can, can screw up, that they can do wrong? I mean, are, are, aren't people going to be effectively concatenating strings just in, in, and then burying it inside a helper? Well, uh, well, that's a, that's a, that's a nice approach is that there, it's, it's not concatenating strings. It's using HTML literals and it's more like interpolation. So, uh, let's say I want to, re- uh, return an HTML text box right now, right? Uh, mm-hmm. in C sharp, you would say, you know, return quote, you know, less than input type equals text, you know, and then do a bunch of sh- string concatenation to build that up. Uh, with this new, Helper syntax, you might just do return less than input type equals blah at, you know, name at value directly in the HTML as uh-huh. if, it, as if you were building a template. So another way to look at it is it's almost like return template. You know what I mean? Return HTML template. But, but you can do that template in line. Does okay, that make more sense? Yeah. So, so because the templating engine is, is the way that it is, it's, um, the older ways of doing things just aren't necessary. It's 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 a, it's a templating language exactly. in itself. There's no reason to do a lot of this plus that plus that type of work. Yeah, I mean the the, the parser and the uh, compiler for this templating engine have been written ground up. So uh, you know, which is another real key benefit of of Razor View Engine and uh, Razor Syntax is that uh, uh, the you know if you look at the Web Forms parser, you know the page parser. Uh, that has deep ties into the ASP.NET runtime. So you, you kind of need the runtime to even run the parser that takes the ASPX code and generates a C-sharp class. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, not everyone realizes that every time you hit an ASPX page, unless you do pre-compilation, uh, there's a runtime compiler that runs, parses that whole thing, and, you know, puts this file in your temporary ASP.NET files that has the full actual code. And, and that code is, you know, a bunch of response.writes, right? Right, right. So with with the uh, Razor syntax, you can um, you can do that outside of ASP.NET. You don't need the ASP.NET runtime in process to you know take a Razor template and compile a class from that template. So um, Andrew Nurse, who wrote the parser for Razor, recently wrote a blog post where he shows how you can uh, invoke the Razor parser outside of ASP.NET to compile a CSHTML file. And I think that's going to open up a lot of really cool scenarios. Uh, for example, if you have a, um, if you want to fully compile, uh, let's say, an ASP.NET MVC application, you could, you could, you know, perhaps use the same code that he did, put in a T4 template, and have the T4 template run it over all your, um, you know, views and compile all your views into an assembly. These things that Andrew is showing are they plans? Is this um, is this? You know, sometimes someone will come out with a piece of software, and then they'll write a blog post about the crazy things you can do with it. But those are kind of filed under crazy things. Is, An- <laughs> yeah. is Andrew yeah. showing us that? Hey, look, I can use Razor to generate HTML and spam people. But <laughs> is that a core? Um, is that a core scenario? Uh, well. What he's showing is a consequence of conscious design choices. So it is a core scenario, for example, that uh, the Razor syntax can be fully compiled. Uh, so without re- without requiring the HP.NET runtime. Um, Scott Guthrie mentioned in his blog post that, for example, we want to look at ways that you can unit test your views if you so choose. Uh, so, you know, I I personally don't, you know, I'm not a fan of unit testing views. I think that's more of a uh, functional testing type of thing. But, but you know, maybe you're building a simple uh, partial view, right? That's really, really simple. And you just want to write a unit test to make sure that a few things are in, in there correctly. Uh, the idea here is that you would be able to write that unit test without having to spawn up an ASP.NET uh, app domain. And that would be you know, a very cool consequence of conscious design choices that we made. And that's some, that, some, that is a scenario that we want to work in and make sure is enabled. 
Yeah, the first thing that I thought about when I saw the that Razor could do that was that I would use it to to generate uh during you know, direct mail, to generate email. Does that seem like a pretty good scenario? Uh yeah, I think that's quite possible. Um <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, sure. I I don't send a lot of emails, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead and take a stand there, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, if you want to start your Spam King empire. Yeah, well, it was less about that, but it was that. more about, I'm trying to think about places where I've done stuff before in a hacky way. I don't way. need any V.1AGRA anymore. What? <laughs> Never mind. I said I don't need any any of your Viagra products. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, we'll cut that out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's early for both of us. Pro- the programmer yeah. should never have podcasts at 9 a.m., my friend. <laughs> That's right. So you're, you're probably podcasting from your pajamas. I, I talked at the MVC Conf yesterday, right? You did too, the uh, MVC uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. dot com. And apparently there was um, some controversy on a controversy. It's, it's funny how people say controversy. There were three tweets. There was intense controversy um, <laughs> on Twitter about whether or not I was wearing pants because it was a virtual conference and we did the whole thing over the... Uh, with a live meeting. Oh, did did oh, so did you actually record video of yourself while you're giving your talk? Yeah, I just uh, I'm everyone else was doing live meeting with um projecting and I just don't like that. I feel that if you if you if you see the person it is more engaging. So I broadcasted video during my my talk. I felt that it was uh, You more know, I I kind of would have liked to have done that except uh I, I I have trouble with the live meeting software. I have no idea how to use it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I, what, what, we probably should have come up with some non-live meeting way to do it. But, um, you know, yeah. Ustream is, is pretty useful, but Ustream makes it, uh, is great if one person is doing the broadcasting. But since people were broadcasting from all over, it would have yeah. been very difficult. We would have had to have had people bounce from room to room or figure out some kind of global, uh, handoff as one person in Seattle yeah. stops. And another person in Australia starts. So there were some complaints about having to install live meaning. It is kind of a crappy. Yeah. But uh, overall, I, I felt that conference was really successful and, and a really ne- interesting model for potential future virtual conferences. I think it was really significant. People had said that it was the best Microsoft conference they'd ever been to uh, <laughs> because they felt that yeah. Microsoft wasn't marketing to them. It was truly an educational conference. Yeah. And. Yeah. That's interesting because I've attended lots of tech eds and PDCs, and I've never really felt I was being sold to, but that may just mean that I'm numb to it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, for me, like, I didn't have to leave my family and go fly somewhere, and it mm-hmm. took very little time out of my day uh, to to give this presentation, and mm-hmm. the, the feedback that I got from the presentation was e- extremely positive. And, and it made me feel good just that this was a conference built around, you know, the product that I work on, ASP.NET MVC, that, that the community uh, uh, people are so passionate about it that, you know, they went on and put, this, uh, put on this conference that is, in many ways is, is kind of a leading indicator of what, where conferences might go into the future, right? It, it's, it's very mm-hmm. innovative. It was very, uh, uh, it was very exciting to be a part of that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I tried to explain to the wife why I thought that this was important to do on my vacation. And uh-huh. <laughs> I was trying to explain to her, there are 540 people that were watching uh, my yeah. silly little talk. I was like, 500 people. Think about all the flying that I did last year to talk to uh-huh. 500 people. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the, yeah, I had a little yeah, bit of amazing. technical difficulties, and I, tw- you know, went on Twitter to say, ah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running into difficulties, but I'll be there soon. And uh, someone replied back, you know, ah, oh, don't worry about it, Phil. There's only 300 people waiting for your talk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, That's great. Tough. Okay, so we've got Razor View Engine. We've got new hooks for dependency injection that that hopefully people will jump jump at and start. Um, Finding out new ways that they can uh, kind of tease apart MVC and, and make it do what they want. Uh, what else? What else do we have in, in MVC three preview one? Uh, we've added support for .NET four uh, data annotations and metadata attributes. So, uh, you know, one conf- bit of confusion that people had around MVC two 
was that even though MVC2 ran on both .NET 3.5 SP1 and on .NET 4, it didn't, out of the box, support .NET 4 data annotations or, or data annotations that were new to .NET 4. And the simple reason was, well, we compiled it against 3.5 so that we could run it on both platforms. And uh, being compiled against 3.5, it has no idea that there's these new attributes in .NET 4. But with ASP.NET MVC 3, we've dropped support for .NET 3.5 SP1. We only support .NET 4 uh, so, because we compile against .NET 4. And by doing so, we get this advantage that we can now take advantage of all the new features in .NET 4, such as conditional parameters and uh, um, these new data annotations. So, uh, you know, one simple case is the, we used to use the display name attribute uh, when you wanted to mark up a property to say, well, when you display this property using one of our templated helpers, uh, use this string. But the display name attribute doesn't support uh, resource strings. But in .NET 4, they added the display attribute, and that mm. supports resource strings and localization. Uh, other uh, validation attributes, for example, uh, there was this, the old validation attributes had an is valid method and you just return true or false and you, you just got the value and that's it. Mm-hmm. With uh, new validation attributes, they have an overload of is valid that gives you this validation context. And that context gives you a lot of information about uh, where you are in the validation so that you can say, oh, I'll use the validation context uh, to look at other properties and... Um, and validate this property based on that things things like that does so does this mean that there is no uh using m v c three outside of .NET four correct okay so the, so two o people can keep doing their thing but the th- m v c three is a is a more than gentle nudge in the direction of moving towards .NET four correct and visual studio twenty ten uh so we you won't be able to build MVC3 apps using Visual Studio 2008. Hmm. Do do you think that'll be a controversial decision, or is that the whole point of doing a preview? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it yes, that that is the the point of the preview. I think uh, there will be a lot of people who will be disappointed by that decision, but um, and who knows, maybe it will be controversial. But I think in the for the long run, for the future of the framework, I think most, I hope most people will understand why we made that decision is that if we stick to .NET 3.5, there's a lot of innovations and improvements that we can't take advantage of, then, you know, our framework it will, will stagnate. And so uh, by moving to .NET 4, a lot of people who aren't yet ready to move to .NET 4, um, you know, won't be able to use it, which is a disappointment. But, for example, the Razor syntax, we wouldn't be able to adopt that because that is built on .NET 4. We had improvements to .NET 4 specifically to support scenarios that we needed to even implement the Razor View Engine. Uh, so, um, in the long run, I think, you know, I personally think it's the right, right decision. I mean, I, I really want to move things forward and not uh, have too much of this attachment to the past. Um, although, I can understand that, uh, you know, it will be painful for some but, uh, you know, I, I think ASP.NVC2 is a great framework as well, and uh, we'll, people, people will be able to use it for a long time. Yeah, I think that that is a really challenging thing. Like, when do you, when does one make that move? But I think the point is that MVC2 is out there. It's, uh, it's open source as well. MVC3 is still open source, right? Same license? Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, about that. <laughs> So MVC2 <laughs> is, uh, you know, released, and MVC3 won't be released for a while anyway, so uh, there is a lot of time for people, you know, to adjust. In terms of the licenses, the way we work with the open source licenses is that uh, we only uh, release the OSI certified open source license, you know, the MSPL uh, source code, when we actually do the RTM release. So that, we did that with MVC1, we did that with MVC2, and we'll probably do that with MVC3. Um, the preview releases, we use uh, what we call, we do release a source code, but it's not under an, uh, an open source license. It's under some ASP.NET pre-release license. Uh, and the I main see. reason we do that is to uh, cut costs, legal costs, because we have to do a whole bunch of legal work every time we release source code under MSPL. 
And it's just easier that when, when we're in development that we just do it under this other license. Interesting. This sounds like a Microsoftism. Uh, sure. It, it, I, I don't think it's unique to Microsoft and that I, I'm sure there are other big companies who are targets for lawsuits that uh, have to do this sort of thing. But mm-hmm. yeah, it, it certainly is uh, a Microsoftism. All right. So oh, oh, uh, it's source opened until it releases and then it's open source just the same as uh, MVC 1 and 2. Uh, that's the plan. All right. And, and then uh, finally, what is, is this going to include any uh, additional tooling or new fancy things that we're going to see in Visual Studio? So in Visual Studio, we'll see a couple of things. One is uh, syntax highlighting and, and IntelliSense for Razor, <laughs> which uh, you know you, I think people would expect. But in Preview 1, we won't have that yet. So that's another important po- point. Uh, which is, you know, kind of tough, but in Preview 1, when you open up a CSHTML file, which is a Razor file, uh, you'll just open it up as a text file. By the time we RTM, we expect to have full Visual Studio support for that. The other thing we're doing in Visual Studio is when you, um, for Preview 1, when you install MVC3, you'll see that there's two project templates for MVC3, one for Web Forms View Engine and one for Razor View Engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, we plan to, that's just for preview one so we could get it out the door. Uh, we plan to have, uh, improvements to our unit test dialog. In fact, we'll probably rename the unit test dialog to be sort of the new project dialog. And, uh, when you, uh, launch, when you create a new MC3 project, you'll get a choice of which view engine you want there and, and perhaps a choice to say, you know, whether you want to include all that account controller stuff or not. Okay. Okay. Have there been any um, secret meetings with existing people who have have view engines that you are you going to have anything additional in uh, in the launch? Will will um, Spark be there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the other thing we're adding is the ability to include other view engines in the add view dialog. So when you uh, right click add view, we launched this dialog that allows you to choose, uh, you know, a, a T4, you know, template, so like a list template, an editor template, uh, that can be used to scaffold your type. And in MVC 1 and 2, obviously, you could only select WebForms View Engine for that. I mean, there was no selection for the View Engine, so we would just, you know, generate a WebForm scaffold of that. Uh, with MVC 3, we've made that dialog extensible. So by default, there's two options now. Uh, ASPX and Razor. And what we'll do is, uh, what we've done in Preview 1 is allow you to get other options in there. And in um, post Preview 1, we'll uh, expand that support so that uh, if you're a big fan of Spark, uh, you can get Spark in there and have, you know, pretty much a first class experience using Spark as your view engine. So, you know, I'll probably work with Lewis to make sure that, uh, those guys implement whatever it is they need to implement to make that happen. All right. Rock on. Are you pretty excited about this? Or has it been real stressful? (laughs) Uh, About what? The whole thing or this particular feature? No, the whole release. Oh, uh, I'm really excited about it. I mean, it's been stressful. I've uh, come down with this condition called uh, dermatitis, and, like, my entire body itches, and I've been... It's, it's been really bad, and my doctor thinks it's stress-related. But at the same time, I'm really excited about this relief. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, getting a huge rash for the community, Phil Hack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Taking one for the team, and we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. This has been another episode of Pencil Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.